beyond the biblical evidence, which we have seen is completely absent, the Jesuits saw that theological capital, theological capital, was to be gained by ascribing middle knowledge to God. Prescience, providence, and predestination could be explained in a manner compatible with human freedom. There is your ultimate authority. There is your ultimate authority for the Jesuits. Because you see, the whole purpose, the founding of the Jesuit order was to do what? Most people don't know. Why did Ignatius Loyola go to the Pope and get the authority to begin the Jesuit order? This was back then, not today. The Jesuits are as leftist liberal as they can be. Mitch Pack was a Jesuit, but he's probably the most conservative Jesuit on the planet. The order itself is absurdly leftist, but they weren't in the 16th century. Why did Ignatius Loyola start the Jesuits? To counteract reformed theology. To counteract the Reformation. And they were successful in many places. They were. So the theological capital was to attack sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, sola deo gloria, solus Christus. That's the theological capital of the Jesuits of middle knowledge. And all of it that had to be compatible with human freedom, why? Why? Because the sacramental system, the sacramental system of Rome is based upon human freedom. You have to have individuals working the system. That's how Rome maintains control of them. If you have a sovereign God and free grace, the sacramental system of Rome collapses as it was functioning in the 16th century. So I think that's extremely relevant. And it is striking to me that when Dr. Craig was uh, debating Christopher Hitchens, and he has asked, well, what, what Christian group can you identify that you disagree with? Teaching heresy. The only thing that Dr. Craig came up with was Calvinism. Calvinism. Um, there's a reason for that. And when you look at those that are promoting middle knowledge today, are they consistent? Are they consistently reformed? Nope. Oh, but, but you can be, I don't believe so. I, I know, I know, I know, I've heard, I've heard the claim. You can be a five-point Calvinist and believe in middle knowledge. Nope. Can't. Well, but I've read people, sorry. Um, the key to reform theology is consistency <laughs> and a theological system that is based upon the defense of the autonomy of man at the expense of the freedom of God cannot be made consistent with any kind of meaningful expression of Reformed theology. You will have to redefine one or the other, or I would say both. Both. But this is absolutely key. It must be seen, understand, understood. So the, the theological ramifications. Nonetheless, foreknowledge is not logically foundational, but is based on God's logically prior middle knowledge and his free decision to create a world. Now, please notice something. This is is based on God's logically prior middle knowledge. So foreknowledge is free knowledge because it's based upon what God does in creation. I want you to see this. And his free decision to create a world. What is the range and content of God's free decision? Because the temptation is to look at that and go, see, God has a eudokia. He has a free decision to create a world. Yeah. The world defined for him by middle knowledge, which is defined by the free actions of creatures. So this isn't creating a world that is specifically to demonstrate 
in its fullness, his attributes, his power, his justice, his glory, his grace. The decision is, I get to create a world. Now that world is determined by my running certain priorities as to what I want that world to do. But the parameters of that world are, do not flow from my free choice. They're determined by middle knowledge. Because by his middle knowledge, God knows all the various possible worlds which he could create and what every free creature would do in all the various circumstances of those possible worlds. For example, God knew that Peter, if he were to exist and be placed in certain circumstances, would deny Christ three times. So instead of the denials by Peter being a part of the sovereign decree of God to demonstrate things for us, to allow for the restoration of Peter later on when Jesus three times asks him, do you love me? Do you love me? Then he uses different terms and, and all the rest of that stuff. Instead of that, the denials of Peter are based upon an inalterable, immutable knowledge that Peter, if placed in those circumstances, was going to act in that way. That's, you see the difference? So instead of God determining for his purposes, it's Peter's nature that determines these things. And it is not Peter's nature as chosen by God. I don't know where this comes from. This is why Dr. Craig said what he said that one day. God has to deal with the cards he's been dealt. What he meant by that was there is a content to middle knowledge that does not flow freely from his creative desire. It's an innate knowledge. So where did the facts of that knowledge come from? Don't know. Don't know. So here is a free decision of his will, God's will. God then chose to create one of those possible worlds. So see the difference between the sovereignty of God creating the very fabric of time to his honor and his glory and the idea that God's free decision is to choose to create one of those possible worlds. His decision has been delimited, to use the phraseology of the book, delimited by something outside of his eudicia, outside of his boule, outside of his thalamatos. It is an inalterable reality of who Peter would be. And evidently, who everyone that Peter interacted with because God has put those people in those places to do the things that they did based not upon his free choice, but based upon looking at, just think about it, the, the servant girl who s says to Peter, you're, you're one of his disciples. So God had to find the exact right human being who in that circumstance would do that. So there wasn't anybody who's alive in the 21st century that would have done that at that point when well, maybe there would have been, but God just decided to put that person in that place. And that's the, but just think of all the possible, oh yeah, there's just so many permutations here. I mean, this really shows us how big God is. But God is being turned into a massive computer. Not a free king, but a massive computer working on data provided from middle knowledge. And the big issue is, where does that data come from? If it does not come from the exercise of his will, it doesn't come from Psalm 33. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? Knowing both every possible world he could create and his decision to create one of them, God foreknows exactly what will happen. That is to say, he has foreknowledge, but this foreknowledge is the inevitable result of his choice to create and to actuate the circumstances everything in the physical universe so as to put 
creatures in to do exactly what he wants them to do in each given circumstance. So they're all micromanaged. All based on middle knowledge of what they would do in that circumstance. And if one person acts autonomously, it all falls apart. <laughs> but they can't. There can be no autonomous free choice. Oh, but they're all autonomous free choices. If they can't do anything other based on middle knowledge, it's not an autonomous free choice. You can pretend it is and say, we've solved it all, but it really doesn't solve anything. Actually, uh, knowing, for example, that Peter would deny Christ three times under certain circumstances. So was there a Peter that would deny Christ only twice? Only once? Four times? I, I don't know. That, that Peter just didn't get created? So how would, if it's never created, how would you know it? I don't know. Knowing, for example, that Peter would deny Christ three times under circumstances and knowing his own decision to bring about those circumstances, so that's where his freedom comes in. God knows what Peter will in fact freely do. Thus, God is able to know future free acts on the basis of his middle knowledge and his creative will. So this is the theological capital. But the theological capital is a fundamental undercutting of the freedom of God to actually do what he desires to do because those possible worlds are delimited by middle knowledge. If it be asked how God has middle knowledge of free decisions by creatures, yeah, that's an important question. Proponents of middle knowledge usually spawn in one of two ways, which I find interesting. Uh, Dr. Craig has a way of saying, well, proponents of middle knowledge, instead of, I say this, um, which is interesting. Number one, God, by his infinite understanding, knows each creature so completely that he discerns even the creature's de free decisions under any conceivable circumstance. God, by his infinite understanding, knows each, and I'm really wondering if the guys noticed what word they used there. What's a, what, what's a creature? What's a creature? Do you see there's a, there's, C R E A T creature that comes from created. I would say to you that biblically, God does know each creature because he created each creature and he created them in a certain way. And that creation of that creature is an expression of God's sovereign will. So God made them the way they are. God decreed that they would have the gifts they would have. Do we believe that the gifts were given come from God? Are the gifts that you have been given, and, and you, you know, we, we don't have to limit this to spiritual gifts. We're talking about the created gifts that you have been given, do they impact the decisions you make in every circumstance you're in? Of course they do. So how can that not be an expression of God's creative will? And so if God made you that way, then clearly he's not delimited by some middle knowledge, that is an expression of his creative desire. That's how he's glorified in you. He made you that way. God, by his infinite understanding, knows each creature so completely he discerns even the creature's free decisions under any conceivable circumstance. Since the moment of middle knowledge is logically prior to God's creation, no actual creatures exist at that moment. That's true. No actual creatures exist at that moment, but God comprehends them as they exist in his mind as possible creatures. Okay, possible creatures, but as they exist in his mind. Hmm. But they are definable because they will make certain decisions. 
And the only way they can be defined is on the basis of what? God having defined them by the exercise of his will. He knows them so well that he knows what they would freely do in any situation because he gifts them and designs them to fulfill his purposes. Number two, statements about how creatures would decide to act in place in certain circumstances are true or false. Since God is omniscient, he knows all truth. Therefore, God simply knows all true statements about how creatures would act in certain circumstances. Now, this is a, I consider it philosophical fun. Uh, other people have developed this uh, maximal being argumentation based on this that we'll look at at another point in time. But statements about how creatures would decide to act, okay, right here, decide to act. To do that requires you to be what? Created. <laughs> Non-created creatures do not decide and do not act. So uh, to talk about statements about them are either true or false, and then say, and God is omniscient, he knows all truth, therefore God simply knows all true statements about how creatures would act in certain circumstances, uh, may make you feel really good in your philosophy class, but it's meaningless drivel, biblically speaking, and out in the real world. In fact, a lot of stuff in philosophy class is meaningless out in the real world, and you know that, those of you that live in that strange world. So there you go.